Not so that they think that they are doing right, but so that they can know your mercy, Lord. Lord, we ask that you protect the offices that you placed in order to protect people in general. And I ask, Father God, that we be diligent in our prayer and not be hateful in speech. In the name of Jesus, I pray, and everybody says, Amen. You give God all the glory. Brothers and sisters, the message the Lord has given me today, and it should be fitting to all of you, and that's crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. The reason why I have it three times is because it can be taken several ways. The first way is when you say crossroads, you repeat it twice, it means there's a strong emphasis on the word crossroads right now more than any other time. And that's why I used it three times. It's just like anything else in the Bible, when it is spoken several times in the same passage, it's a certain intensity to it, to get your attention. But there's something else too. Not only do I want you to, to really understand that we are at a crossroads. When I say that, I'm talking about worldwide, I'm talking about nationwide, and I'm talking about churchwide. The body of Christ. All of those three, if you will, identities are all found in the Bible. And they're all spoken about and concerns to everyone, whether it be the world that we know, whether it be governments that we know, nations, and whether it be the church. They've all been brought to crossroads in the the crossroads is what I'm talking about is whether or not they truly serve the God of creation or they serve a God of man. God has allowed people through his long suffering to bring them to a point to repentance. The word of God says that he would have it that his will is that all men would come into repentance. But we know that's not going to happen because men have a free will. But in that, the reason why I'm saying this, what I'm saying, concerning the three emphasis or the three crossroads and then the emphasis on that and also the emphasis on the three different areas that there are crossroads of is because of what we are experiencing right now in this nation. What I want you to hear is whatever happens in this nation affects the world and will also affect Israel. So the purpose of God is something that you need to understand regardless of what you want to see come to pass, you need to see and understand the purpose of God. First of all, crossroads don't come because of Satan or because of the enemy. Can anybody tell me who they come from? They come from God. Why? <clears throat> to cause his people to stop going between two different opinions. Between stopping people from halting as Elijah said. How long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you stumble between two opinions? We're talking about God's people here. And then we're talking about the world here. The United States has been touted as being a Christian nation, which I do not believe they are a Christian nation. I don't believe that we ever were a Christian nation, but I do believe that we were founded on Christian principles. And that's a difference. Because to be founded on a Christian nation means that we're all, the everyone was a follower of Jesus Christ. But that's not true. But the thing is this, that there is evidence for the fact that this nation was founded on Christian principles. And also that this nation was founded and allowed to grow uh, tremendously for one reason only, not to replace Israel, but to buffet between the enemies of Israel, the world. The United States would be a buffeter God would bless the United States, I believe, according to the Word of God, so that they could be a barrier between the other nations 
and Israel. The thing that you need to understand is this nation is as a at a crossroads. Whom we will serve. And the heartbeat of this nation is what will be seen shortly. Our moral compass is completely out of whack, no matter what anybody says. Humanism is the ruling god of this world right now. Everything that I just told you is at a crossroads because at this crossroad, God's allowed this to expedite His purpose. One way or another, His purpose will be seen in all this. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. Which side will you be found on? Now don't get this confused with, well, you trying to say I'm not saved. I'm talking about there's a straight and narrow path that we all come through. The doorway is Jesus Christ. But there, what I'm talking about is there's always, always a crossroads after that that God allows. Why? To prove whom you will serve. And this is where we are today. I've seen mega churches arguing back and forth. Again, I don't know who in the world that they're following. I don't know what kind of gospel that they're preaching, but I know it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. Open your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy. Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy and look with me at Chapter 32. When you get there, say amen. I want you to look at verses 28 through 37. You get there, say amen. This is God speaking through Moses. He says, For they are a nation void of what? Counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock? With a capital R, is that right? Their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Brothers and sisters, if you will, now turn with me quickly to 1 Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18, verses 11 through 21. You're well familiar with what I'm going to be talking about right now, but again, I want to emphasize to me the paralleling of God's people under Ahab and his wife Jezebel. God's people under Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab was one of the worst kings Israel ever had. Yet he was considered of God's people. He married into a pagan religion. I mean, Baal, all the surrounding nations were, were pagans. But yet he married into not, not just a, a queen, but a, a pagan priestess. We all know about Jezebel, right? We all know that Jezebel is one of these names that uh, is constant in the Old Testament and also is found in the book of Revelation for a reason. There's a tremendous spirit attached to Jezebel and it's always attached to leadership, always. Ahab was the king, but Jezebel's the one that pulled strength. 
Don't ever underestimate what you see. Don't ever underestimate what you think you see. Always ask God to give you discernment in what you see. See, a lot of people at first, I'm sure, when it came to Ahab, they didn't even consider Jezebel to be a problem, but she influenced him a lot. It doesn't remove the responsibility of him being a king and him having an authority, but he allowed Jezebel to come in and set up certain altars to worship false gods. And we know that she was religious because she mixed that in with the religion of the Israelites. So much so that there was very little recognition concerning whom God Almighty Jehovah was as compared to who Baal is. I'm paralleling something for you. So get a word picture as I'm speaking, please. Understand where I'm coming from. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. What do you think that out of nowhere, can any, I challenge anyone to tell me in the Bible where you can find where it spoke about Elijah before he even came this time and point in Israel's history. There's nowhere. In fact, they say, is Elijah the Tisbite came upon the scene. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, from some little bitty dot somewhere, God pulled him and placed him there. The anointing of God was upon him so greatly that he didn't need a whole lot of recognition it was known who he was. God placed him there at the most crucial time in Israel's history. One of the most crucial times in Israel's history. There had no moral compass anymore. The morals were totally, completely corrupt and perverted. They had no more. The military power that they had was divided and, and constantly strife with all kind of treason and rebellion. So far, sound kind of familiar, does it? Their singularity of unity was not there. They were very weak. The people were weak in nature. The people of God were weak in nature because they were confused. They submitted and surrendered to the government that was above them, that was there before them in every aspect, even though it did not even seem similar or recognizable into the, the religion that they were called, Judaism. So much so that Jezebel and Ahab helped the people uh, erect a new altar unto God. A modern altar unto God. Which, if it was in design according to the altars of Baal, which I know it was because all the prophets were of Baal, that they had a lot of sexual uh, promiscuity going on around the altar. They had a lot of other things going on around the altar. And it was acceptable to the people because after all, the government, the, the ruler, the king, and his wife, they well said, hey, listen, this is acceptable. This is okay. But Elijah came on the scene out of nowhere and he put his finger on the heartbeat of the people of God. And this is where we look. In chapter 18 of 1 Kings, it says, in verse 11, it says, And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Listen, this is amazing, huh? Elijah, a nobody, comes on the scene and tells the people, he says, Now you go tell your king, Elijah is here. In other words, you're going to tell your king, the spokesman of God Almighty is here. To do what? To turn the people of God back to God. Elijah comes on the scene. And this is what he says. Behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. He knew that the Spirit of the Lord was upon whom? Elijah. Because he said, hey, listen, the Spirit of God is upon you. And when, when I tell Ahab that, and I can't find you because the Spirit of God is going to carry you wherever you need to go. I'm left dealing with Ahab. 
what he's saying. He says, but I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he shall kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. Are you all with me? I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Balaam. Now therefore send, this is how direct and authoritative, Elijah is in the face of Ahab. He said, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400. So we know it's not just 450. How many was it? 800 and what? 50, which eat at Jezebel's table. Is that what you were to say? Yes. And Ahab, in other words, they serve Jezebel. They're under the spirit of Jezebel. They prophet, they prophecy under the spirit of Jezebel. And what does Jezebel want to do most? Control and destroy what? God's people, the word of God. I'm just preaching what God told me to preach. And Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long help halt you between two opinions? Somebody else has another translation. Brother, Brother Kevin, what does it say? How long shall you stumble? How long will you go between two different opinions? There you go. I like that even better. There's something to have stumbled. Limping, it means, man, you, you, you know, you just barely making it one way or another. You don't know. You don't have any strength in either one. That's right. No stability. No confidence. How long will you limp between two opinions? How long will you halt between two opinions? And you can see that when you halt it, it's considered like a limp. If the Lord God be God, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him and said, oh, we're going to follow the Lord. Is that what they said? They said, and the people answered him, not a word. See, this is what bothers me today. In the body of Christ. The word of God does not mean to be debated. The word of God is the word of God. If you're a believer, there should, shouldn't even be a discussion about what God's word means. Amen. When it comes to the word of salvation, the power of the gospel, the, the, the Torah, the Tanakh, all these things are in line. They're all teachers. It all was designed to teach us, to bring us to that place of faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that everything that we're talking about right now, everything that Elijah represented was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. It gets me. Is they heard the word of God, they saw the man of God, they heard the word of God. He didn't say anything he did was they didn't have in their writings already. And yet they didn't answer a word to that. They didn't know who to believe. Today, tell me you don't see that in the churches. You don't see that in the populace. You don't see that in the public arena. You don't see that in the politicians, uh, politicians stand. It's the same thing. Nobody answers a word. And when they do answer a word, it's some kind of fictitious hybrid type word that, that comes off of something completely different from the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not even found in the word of God as a, as a, as a contextual word. 
It's taken out of context to build something for a particular type of person or people or whatever it may be, but not, not the word of God for all people. I told you this before and I'll tell you again. God is not a respecter of persons. God does not apologize for the blood that he shed for all nations, for all tribes, for all tongues. God's restoration and God's restorative plan from the beginning of time will come to pass. But we as a nation, we as a world, we as a church, and even in Israel, we're all at a crossroads and we're all connected. You want to talk about your individual crossroad? Well, let's get outside your individual crossroad and let's look at the community that we belong to. We say that we belong to the community of believers. We're part of the body of Christ. Well, then we have to, there is something called getting outside of yourself. It's called dying to yourself. It's called being taking up your cross and following after Jesus Christ. The word of God well says in documents that Jesus Christ is the victory said this to all those who were listening. After he told them if you want to follow him, that you had to pick up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow him. He came down a few sentences after that, a few paragraphs after that, a few scripture texts after that. And he says, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. If you're ashamed of my word when my father comes, I will be ashamed of you. So when churches are spouting all kind of stuff, talking about their needs and talking about this and that, over the word of God, they're saying, God, you're not good enough or able enough or sufficient enough to take care of what your word says. We call it your liar. And this is pretty much why they didn't answer a word yet. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah 6. And I want you to look at verse 10 with me. Jeremiah 6, verse 10 through 19. When you get there, say amen. How many of you believe the church is under siege right now? The true body of Christ. How many of you believe that? Okay, I, I liken that to what was spoken by Jeremiah concerning Jerusalem. It says this, To whom shall I speak and give warning? Are y'all with me? Verse 10 of Jeremiah 6. Anybody with me? To whom shall I speak and give warning? that they may hear it. Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned into others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, even or everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace. <laughs> But there is no peace. You know, in our text reading, you hear the same thing said. Word of God says here, were they ashamed when they had committed an abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them, saith the Lord, or they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Now, this is what I want to get to. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. Word of God says in verse 16. Thus saith whom? The, the Lord. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for what? The old paths. Not just old paths of tradition, not just old paths of, of what we think is right, 
but he says here, where is the good way? And what does it say? And what? Walk therein. And you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will, we will not walk therein. Also, I said, watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. What do you want God to do when they will not walk in what they know to be true? And what do you want God to do when they will not hearken to the trumpet, to him blowing a warning? What do you want God to do? He says, therefore hear ye nation and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. Why? Because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my laws, but rejected it. Well, pastor, where is the mercy? Where is the grace? Right here. God didn't have to warn them. He warned them. He brought the word of God to them. But they didn't want to walk in it, and neither did they want to listen to the warning. So what do you want God to do? He loves his people enough to allow them to stew in their own sowing and reaping. Remember what I told you, no matter what, don't ever forget the law of sowing and reaping because it will, you will, this nation will, this world will reap what they sow. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. Now that brings us to our text reading. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 24. Yeah, it's a long reading, but it needs to be read in its full context to understand. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 24. And our key text verses are verses 21 through 23. Everybody get that? Get me on the board? Yes. When you get to 1 Thessalonians, say amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The Word of God says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety. Did we not hear something about peace, peace, peace just recently? Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. He's talking about a certain group of people, not, not, not the church, not supposed to be the true body of Christ. You understand that? But he's writing to all people that are underneath his speaking voice. But he's saying, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, right? Can I hear an amen? amen. So that means that we would heed to our crossroads, whether it be national, worldwide, individually, or church-wise, that we heed to the old ways, and we listen, and we see what was good, right? What God's Word said to do, and what would we do? Walk in them. And we heed when the trumpet blows, we, we would be what? Warned, right? Okay. It says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light. And in Ephesians it says, if you're the children of light, walk in the light. Here it says, you are the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. You see, that's what happened, I believe, to the people that Elijah was sent to. You know, they just didn't say anything. They just kind of went along with the majority. They just kind of went along with the government. They just kind of went along with the leaders that, that, that they were underneath. They just kind of let them go along so much so that they, they didn't even speak up anymore. <laughs> they didn't object to anything anymore. They just follow the, the crowd, you know, as the, the herd mentality. They just kind of flowed with the herd. So that when it came time, when Elijah says, who are you going to follow? In other words, how long will you hold, how long will you live between two opinions? It says that 
you know, if it be God, follow God. But if it be Baal, follow Baal. And it says they could not say a word. You know why? Because they've been so used to not saying anything, just pretending things would get better, just pretending peace, 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 just pretending that in the end that it will all work out. We're all just worshiping the same God, just change altars. But they've got the cross rules. And that's why I tell you that man doesn't bring cross rules. The devil doesn't bring a cross. He doesn't want you to make a decision. Man don't want you to make a decision anymore. God says you have to make a decision. You have to commit all the way to me. That's why God brings cross rules. That's why God is bringing a cross road to this nation. That's why God is bringing a cross road to this world. That's why God is bringing a crossroads to the body of Christ. That's why God's bringing a crossroads to those who profess to follow Jesus Christ. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. The intensity of a crossroad is here today, right now. It is a tsunami right up beneath the, the surface of our lives. No matter the dimension that it's in, it will infect and affect everything we do hereafter. It will infect and affect what happens with Israel. I want you to know that Israel, no matter what anybody says, no matter what politician says, no matter what church says, no matter what, what preacher says, no matter what prophet says, if they are not speaking for Israel, then God is not for them. I'm not saying that. Who's saying that? The word of God. Does it mean that he condones everything that every Israelite does or the government? Of course not. But as far as his purpose, Israel is the apple of his eye. The church has not replaced Israel. Repla replacement theology is from the pits of hell. God has not cut off his people. In fact, he's used us to make his people jealous according to his word. They are the natural branch. We've been grafted in. And it speaks about that in Romans. Anyway, the word of God says here. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for, an, for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God had not, say it with me, for God had not appointed us to what? Wrath. Wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify, build up one another, even as also you do, as we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to, them, to, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn. Is that what the word says? In other words, we encourage you, brethren. We encourage you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We beseech you. We encourage you. We almost beg you. He says to warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. What is the litmus, litmus test for all that's good for all men? What is our guideline for what is good for all men? Thank you. The Word of God. The Word of God. Even those who don't know Him, He still brings sunshine. He still brings rain. He still lets them enjoy the labor of their hands. He gives them shelter. He gives them the opportunity to come know him. He's a merciful God. 
Those who don't know him don't have grace, but they have mercy. Those of us who do know him have mercy and grace. You see, grace doesn't come to those who don't receive him as Lord and Savior. It appears unto them, but it doesn't have, doesn't inhabit them. Because grace came by another word and by truth. <coughs> the word of God says this. See that none render evil for evil unto man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19. Quench not the spirit. Verse 20. Despise not prophesying. And our text verses are the next two verses. Or the next three, rather. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace. The very God of what? Peace, peace shall do what? Sanctify, Sanctify you what? Holy. holy. Does holy mean H-O or completely? Every dimension of your life. Every dimension of your life, right? It says here, and the very God of peace sanctify you. W H O L L Y means every part of your life, every dimension of your life. And I pray God, your what? Whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Amen. Now listen to the Amplified. Same text verses. 21 through 23. It says, but test and prove all things until you can recognize what is good. To that hold fast. Abstain from evil. Now, how does this work in the churches that say, well, it's okay to embrace evil. It's okay to be a participant of unfruitful works. It doesn't line up, does it? Why doesn't it line up? Because the Bible says that we're children of light, of day, not of night, not of darkness. It says, abstain from evil, shrink from it. And keep aloof from it, far apart from it. And whatever, in whatever form or whatever kind it may be. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. Separate you, separate you from profane things. Make you pure and holy, again, consecrated to God. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Faithful is he who is calling you to himself and utterly trustworthy, and he will also do it. Fulfill his call by hallowing and keeping you. Brother, pray for us. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Amen. Faithful is he who calleth you, and also will do it. Father God, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Jesus. Brothers and sisters, your theme today is this. How long will people ignore the law of sowing and reaping? How long will people ignore the law of sowing and reaping? Remember, your text was found in Romans 21 through 23. And brothers and sisters, I believe that we are at a juncture in this nation, in this world, and in the body of Christ. I believe that we are in that place in our daily lives, in a nation, in a church, 
in the world that calls for a stance. It calls for a place of major commitment, one way or another. Because one way or another, you will be found on one side of it or another. All people will have to make, and this will really determine where their hearts are, where their moral genetics are aligned with God Almighty or the world and His God. That spiritual tsunami that I'm talking about, if you stay still long enough, you'll feel your feet shaking. You'll feel the big movement underneath your feet, spiritually speaking. You can feel the heartbeat of uh, the nation, the pulse of the world. And you can sense that something is coming to a crossroads where not only a dividing line will be seen, but a commitment to one God or the other. The God of this world is not God Almighty, small g. It is right now, it has the face of humanism. It means it looks like man. It's not God. And you see that same uh, scenario given in Romans chapter 1 when it says they, they, did, they created God in the image of birds and, and corruptible man. Humanism is what is before you right now. Humanism is the veil of this world. Humanism has put on another cloak called religion, but Ahab's wife just built the same thing. See, they profess to know God, but they're abominable in their works. They deny Him. Today, this world as we know it, everything you just, you have to understand what's going on. It's not, not just every day is going to go along like it, it's always going along. No, there is a tsunami that will and is coming and it's underneath us. And the body of Christ, those whom are truly abiding in the shadow of the Almighty, in that secret place, they will say to the Lord, you are my refuge, because they know him. They don't know about him anymore. They know him. Because not only have they heard been taught of him, they've actually received salvation that has transformed them. Knowing that they're not the same people they used to be. And knowing that they're accountable to keep their minds renewed so they're not conformed to the world. But continuously transformed. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. We need to stay on high alert. Throughout all the recorded history of mankind, there has always been a crossroads. There was a crossroads when Noah was building the ark. 120 years, God showed them through righteous preaching what was coming. They didn't believe it. And they suffered the penalty of it. They sold what they reaped, they sold. It says that Noah obeyed unto God, obeyed, obeyed God unto the saving of his household. We know that the ark in itself is a type and shadow of none other than Jesus Christ. Type and shadow. Pitched in. Inside and outside, no leakage, protection from all the elements of the world, from all the judgment. What did Jesus Christ do when he died on that cross? He paid the penalty of what? Judgment. judgment. When those of us are where? Brother Brian, where? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation. Say what? For those who are in Christ Jesus who walk what? Not after the flesh, but after the spirit. All throughout the court of history, there's always been crossroads before people personally, collectively, nationally, worldly, and in the church world as well. 
Today is no different, except I believe this sets things in rapid motion for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Primarily concerning Israel. I believe one of the things that will happen uh, concerning this election, depending on the outcome of it, will accelerate um, concerns about Israel. I'll just leave it to you in that way. Because, you see, when this nation turns against Israel, then God will turn against this nation. That's not me saying this. God's word says that in Zechariah. He says he will put a ring of fire on them. He will fight against all their enemy. Church, I also believe the major crossroads that are before us today speaks about, as I said, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 9 that we read. And it's about the second coming of the Lord. And it is at hand. We know it's been at hand since the moment that Jesus Christ was raised from the grave. But it's closer now than it's ever been. And it will come suddenly, according to what the Word of God said in 1 Thessalonians. Why? Because that's what's happening now in all the world. It's more intense. That's why I have crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. It's more intense than anything I've ever witnessed in all of my life. It's the battle of battles for the soul of the nation. And nations, including the church. And what will make the difference on which path we find ourselves on as a nation and a people under God, the genuine church, is what we really stand for and are committed to when we're at those crossroads. When we're at those crossroads. See, it's easy to say what you stand for when you're not pressured. But when you're pressured, you're at a crossroads. And that's where it counts. Your voice will be heard. Your vote will be counted. And God will know it. Amen. Church, this is where the nation stands now. You see, this nation that we live in, I love this nation because it's offered so much to us by God's grace. And you in order to appreciate it, you have to look all around at the other countries. What they have to go through. They haven't gone through that. Today, I look at the church. What the church, the church in this, these United States has no power. There's no power, Brother Jeff. Well, I know some pastors that have all, no, 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 no. The church as a whole has no power. Not because God hasn't gifted them with the power. But he gifts them with the power and the authority of the gifts to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you notice that when Jesus Christ sent his 12 and then he sent his 70, he sent them out in his authority to speak about the good news, to speak about the kingdom of God. And the enemy, they cast out devils and demons. They could not withstand the authority of Jesus Christ because they were ushering in, they were bringing in, and speaking about a new kingdom. And in other places it says that Jesus Christ could do very little, especially in his own hometown. You know why? Because they didn't believe who he was. A lot of people say, oh, the church doesn't heal anymore. The church doesn't deliver anymore. The church doesn't do this anymore. Yeah, well, you know, the people of God, in order for that to happen, they've got to believe. Unfortunately, much of the professing church world as well is in that place, that crossroads. And what happens at the crossroads will have a ripple effect throughout the world, especially, as I said earlier, Israel. And another one of our foundational readings that we read, that we talked about, Elijah, one of the most dramatic all fast over. Oh, you saw that up, praise God. Reflexes, thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> little lightness there. And another one of the foundational readings, like you just said, in 1 Kings chapter 18, we're talking about Elijah. To me, he's one of the most 
prominent characters of the Old Testament for more than one reason. I mean, I, he is my go-to God. God always brings me back to uh, Elijah and Isaiah. Elijah, because Elijah is prominent in the Old Testament because he deals with what we see happening today in this nation and what we see happening in the body of Christ. See, this nation professes to be Christian, just like uh, Ahab's people, northern, the northern kingdom of Israel, professed to be followers of God, Jehovah, but they were not. They were followers of Baal. They just incorporated God and Baal together. But yet, they were considered God's people. This nation also is considering themselves God's people, but they've incorporated God Almighty into the worship of Baal. Is that not true? I'm not being critical. I'm just being straight. straight. I'm being honest. It is one of the most dramatic stories found. Billy Graham did a, an old message way back on this when I was doing some study work and several, several others. But way back when he first came in uh, and, and to fruition, when, I forgot which, it must have been probably in the Vietnam War. But he, made a, he did a, a sermon on it. He said, this nation is at a crossroads. And that's been many years back. I'm saying the same thing. David Wilkerson called out the false prophets and the false preachers and teachers. I'm doing the same thing. They called them out by name. I don't have the privilege to do that. You should know if you are being taught by the Holy Spirit led into all truth, you know when somebody's preaching from the hip and not from the heart. But Elijah, let me get back to him. Elijah, as I said, is one of the most dramatic stories of the Bible, as far as I'm concerned. Because it records the most direct question that can be asked by any man or person of God to any people that claim to be God's people. He said, how long halt you between two opinions? How long will you live between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answer not a word. That's the key. The people answer not a word. Because they didn't know anymore. They didn't know who God was and who God isn't anymore. Yes, the God of this world, small g, is humanism. And it blinded the eyes of those from the gospel that we preach today. But he didn't, he didn't need a whole lot of help. He had so many other people wanting to be blinded to the gospel. Open your Bibles quickly to, to Luke 9. And then I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 1. This is just off the cuff. The Holy Spirit is just directing me to go there real quick. Because I mentioned it earlier by His direction. I want to solidify it by His Word. Luke 9. Verse 23, we know what this word says. It says, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, that's the key, for my sake, the same shall save it. But this is what I wanted you to hear. Right now, there is a gospel, a hybrid gospel, not only the prosperity message, but there's something even more perverted than that, and that's where they seem to think that God, it's all right for them to put God's word in their mouth while they're living abominable before God. And I'm talking about the pulpits. We read that in our previous reading in, our, in our Psalms 50. He says he's going to tear some people apart because they dare to put his holy word in their mouth, knowing that he was totally against that. The word of God says here, for well, what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? And I would have to lay that down before all professing Christians right now. 
That which you are so focused on, so centered on, that you want to just uh, declare all these kind of hate things and declare that God's okay with this and God's okay with that because, you know, it's a different culture and it's a different, a different group of people. And, and we have, no, listen, God is God and He died for all the sin of this world. And every man, woman, and child of the age of accountability needs a Savior. That Savior is Jesus Christ. And it's about sin and the forgiveness of sin and about living in gratitude because you are forgiven. God knows our needs. That's why he's going to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. He knows that. And he will expand it upon that. And he goes on to say, for what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Now listen, when churches and pastors and professing believers Start saying, well, God didn't mean that. God is, God is not a judging God. God doesn't, you know, God doesn't hate. God hates sin, brothers and sisters, no matter how you look at it. So much so that he sent his only begotten son to die for that sin so that we would have an opportunity, a chance to live with him as, he, as we were created to live with him in fellowship with him. He says here, for who shall ever shall be ashamed of me and of what? My words. So when Believers and pastors and politicians change God's word to mean something else and to gravitate towards unfruitful, dark works. And you don't say a word. You don't stand up against it. You don't commit against it. What is that saying about us? We're compliant, which makes us associated with unfruitful, dark works. We sow what we reap. We reap what we sow. You know why Saul was voted into office, King Saul? Because the people cried so much to God and the prophet because they wanted a king like everybody else had. They didn't trust God to govern them. And yet he had brought them through the most horrendous times. But look what, this is what I want to say. But whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words. Now, let me ask you something. If, if a politician speaks about the word of God but kind of redefines it, re uses it to, to, to build a platform to, to get particular votes, or a, a pastor or a prophet reconfine or redefines God's word to draw people into self, what are they saying? They're saying that God's a liar and that God's word is not good enough, but theirs is. Right? So they're, in other words, they're ashamed of the word of God. It's not good enough for today's man, right? Today's man is no different than the first man that fell. He still needs God. He always will need God. He says this, Of him shall the son of man be ashamed. You hear what he's saying? He said, let me read in context before I shut down again. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the son of man be ashamed. When he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. Now go with me quickly before I run out of time. First Corinthians. Let's start, if you will, in verse 19. Well, no, I'm going to go to verse 17. Chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 17. For Christ sent me, and this is Paul talking, for Christ sent me not to baptize. He didn't say that he wouldn't allow him to baptize, but that was not his primary focus. But to preach the gospel. That's my primary focus, to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, say it with me, for it is what? Written, I will, hear me well now, this is not me, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? 
Where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks or the world or the Gentiles what foolishness. But unto them which are called. That means where? Called where? In Christ Jesus. Both Jews and Greeks. Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised, God had chosen, yea, and bring and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us what? Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Yes and amen. As I was saying about Elijah, and I'm almost finished. To me, Elijah is, as I said, the most remarkable character in the Old Testament. You know, he's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament. And when Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he was one of the two witnesses there that talked with our Lord about future events to come. You know my thoughts on that. I know who the other witness is. A lot of theologians don't agree, but it doesn't matter. I choose my battles. I know what God's word says. I know that Elijah definitely is one of them for a reason, for a purpose. Elijah was taken up for a purpose. How long will you halt and stumble over two mindsets that are directly opposed to mind? They are two directly opposed to mindsets. The world I understand, but the body of Christ I do not understand. Church here, in his life story that we went through, it was the darkest moment for Israel, just like it is in the United States. Never had a nation gone so low morally, spiritually, militarily, or economically as it was in this hour. To me, this is where we are as a nation today. In the United States and in the church. The nation was struggling for its very existence, and out of nowhere came a little wild, long-haired, woolly young man called Elijah, and he told the people, even the, the king, he said, I'm here. <laughs> he said, I'm here. And I get mad. You've been quiet far too long. You've been muted far too long. King Ahab, you and Jezebel been deceiving the people too long, and the people of God, you've been following along like a herd far too long. First of all, I'm going to help you restore the altar of God. And in doing so, you're going to tear down the altar of Baal. Proverbs 14, 7 through 12. Tells us to go from the presence of a foolish man. Brothers and sisters, where are the churches today? And their convictions about morality? Where are the churches today in their conviction about God's word, about sin, about being separate from unfruitful works of darkness? And why are so many professing believers following after Hollywood icons who have sold their souls to the devil? 
I've never seen more believers bow their knee to, to athletes or Hollywood icons to follow what their opinion is about who God is. What's the matter with us? As we said, Proverbs 14, 7 through 12 says this, go from the presence of a foolish man. It says, go from, don't cling to him. When thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. Why? Because fools make a mock at sin. But among the righteous there is favor. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger do not intermeddle with his joy. For the house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. And there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. This nation, this world, the church, Israel, all at a crossroads. I read once before that it used to be said that that Mary, Queen of Scots, was more afraid of the prayers of a godly man such as in her time. His name was John Knox. He was a preacher and evangelist. Then she was of all the armies of England. You know why, Brother Roger? It says, because she said, one man and God constitute a majority anywhere at any time. Brothers and sisters, Jezebel was the driving force behind the king, which is her veil. And don't get Jezebel uh, tied into gender, it's a spirit. But I know this that Jezebel has to cling, that spirit has to cling to someone in authority. It's very interesting. You see, Jezebel didn't believe in the God of Moses or the God of ancient Israel. She didn't believe in the God of Abraham. She believed in Baal. And Baal was one of the worst forms of worship that we've ever known, at least till now. I believe the world has superseded that. Because you see, it was the worship of Baal was filled with sensuality and sex and orgies human sacrifice and all the rest and every form of conversion imaginable. Speaking about that, keep this in prayer, not too far from our home in Branch and Mowater. They're establishing a, a swing club. And if you don't know what that is, check it out. It is, it's nothing but pornography and prostitution and orgies on the hoof. And they want to legalize it. Of course, they say you can't come unless you're invited. But my point is this. What gives them the idea that they can set up a place like that unless they already have a lot of people that are part of that? Amen. Brothers and sisters, Elijah he said that. How long will you halt between two opinions? And I think that throughout history we've seen the same crossroads where people just before totally destroying themselves, they started bowing down nationwide to a false god of sex and violence, murder, child sacrifice, child trafficking, all these things. And I see the same thing happening now. And it's being accepted as okay. It's the tsunami underneath the surface. Second Timothy 3 verses 1 through 5 warns us about that. In perilous times, men will be lovers of themselves. In other words, they'll be self-centered and more focused on fulfilling their own appetites. I want you to know something. As I close today, in the next two minutes, Elijah stood by himself against 850 prophets. 
He stood by himself. Him and God stood by themselves against 850 prophets of Jezebel and stood against the king, the ruler of all the northern part of Israel and his wife Jezebel. And they defeated every one of them until it came to the time where Elijah ran ahead of Ahab to deal with Jezebel and he let his emotions get the best of him because he thought that she would run and hide and cower just like the others did. But she didn't because she had a purpose. That spirit had a purpose to destroy the word of God, to destroy the worship of the one true God. But God had a greater purpose. He met Elijah where he was. He didn't let Elijah cower for too long. He didn't let him shut his mouth for too long. He reminded him that God had a purpose for all that happened. Even his running away from uh, Jezebel was for God's purpose. What was that purpose? What was that purpose, Master? So that he could anoint Eliza and so that he could anoint Jehu. Jehu would take care of Ahab or to turn into ruling where Ahab failed. He would destroy the altars. He would destroy the, the works of, of, of Ahab. Elisha would deal with all the false prophets. God had a purpose. If you don't know who Jehu is, I recommend you, you do a quick study of that. Brothers and sisters, the word of God says that God's not going to allow anyone to have an altar to Baal in the church, nor in our hearts, to materialism in our homes, to self-centeredness, sexualism, orgies, pervertedness, he will destroy that applies to the church and the nation. People who proclaim Jesus the Lord must come out for Jesus Christ. He must be first in Lord in every area of their lives if they are to be accepted by God. God demands us to be fully committed to Him publicly. Why? Can anybody tell me why? Because He fully committed publicly to dying for all men on that cross. He didn't die in secret. He doesn't want you and the rest of the church and myself to be called Nicodemuses. Nicodemus was only allowed to hide in the dark for God's purpose until he came to a point to where he retrieved Jesus' body or helped him retrieve Jesus' body so that they could bury him. After that, Nicodemus was never in the dark again. Crossroads, crossroads, crossroads. Why is what I'm saying so important? Because today, everybody's looking for a champion to deliver them. Everybody's looking for someone who sounds like God. Who sounds like they got the answer, the wisdom of the world. And that God has, has sanctified them in some kind of form, whether it be behind the pulpit or whether it be in a political stage. They're all looking for a champion. But then the truth of whom they followed comes shouting back at them through their works. How can this be? Because the word of God says in Titus, it says to the pure in heart and conscience, all things are pure, but to the defiled and corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and consciences are defiled and polluted. Why? Simply say it because they profess to know God. They profess to recognize, perceive, and be acquainted with him, but they truly deny and disown and renounce him by what they do. That's Titus 1, 15 and 16. Brothers and sisters, Elijah taught us one thing and Jesus teaches us the same thing. He says crossroads are not designed by the devil. They are brought about by God. You and I must make a choice not only to enter into the straight and narrow, but to stay in the straight and narrow. Because there will always have a crossroads. There will always have a broad path. 
It will always have a place called the path of least resistance with the world and with Baal. But what we sow, we will reap. What really makes the difference is whether or not we hear the message, whether or not we hear the trumpet, whether or not we seek the right paths, and whether or not we commit totally to the right paths, whether it be a church, whether it be a nation, whether it be a world, or whether it be a believer. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I ask, Father God, that Father God, your word find a place in everyone's heart that is able to hear this word, whether it be here or elsewhere, whether it be through the uh, YouTube or whatever it may be, Lord God, that they hear the message behind the word, that they hear the trumpet blow, that they hear the word of God, not me, not condemnation in any kind of form, but love. For the word of God says, Lord God, that God will send the spirit of delusion, strong delusion. And that strong delusion comes upon those, Father God, who do not have the love or the truth, Lord. I do not espouse to have the truth by myself. I, I just humbly declare the truth because the word of God has said it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Father. God, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, made the word of God that I hold in my hand, the will of the Father made known to every common man that is willing to seek the Father's will. In the name of Jesus, I give you all the glory and all the people say, Amen. Amen. Would you give God all the glory?